does it take to make workshops work? And how can we facilitate collaboration that sticks and leads to results? My name is Miriam Hatnas, and with the Workshops Work podcast, I'm on the mission to find the magic ingredients that make workshops work. Today on the show is Yannick Panaitz, and we speak about board games and how board games can help us to facilitate the board games. So stay tuned. And by the way, if you don't have pen and paper at hand to take your own notes, why don't you scroll down to the show notes to find the link to download my free one-page summary. And now, enjoy. Hello, Yannick. Hi. Welcome to the show. Thank you. I like to be here. Yes, and I already had to pause you. <laughs> Say, no, 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 don't tell me. Tell the audience. <laughs> So I'm really excited. Yes, really excited. me too. Me too. And to warm up also the audience to learn about you. When did you start calling yourself a facilitator? And actually, do you? Well, that's a good question because I'm lucky that I got that one in advance because I already know that's the question you start with. So I had some time to think about that. And I think I'm doing the job of a facilitator longer than I call myself a facilitator. And I think I started to actually call myself a facilitator when I became self-employed. And this is like about a year ago. And it was because I had to distinguish more what kind of role I want to fill and how do I approach a certain topic. And before that, I felt it's more like, okay, I'm kind of a consultant or I'm a trainer and I'm in a workshop room and I give some workshops. And now I feel I have to distinguish if I'm in a role of a moderator, if I'm in a role of a facilitator or if I'm in a role of a trainer. And that all comes with different responsibilities and different duties, I feel, um, to fulfill that kind of role. So that's when I started with my self-employment to distinguish between those different roles, and I started to call myself also a facilitator. So how would it impact your way of preparing a session and communicating with a group if you wear your facilitator hat or your moderator hat or your trainer hat? Yeah. Well. I think it's one of the really important parts about that is uh, if I work alone or if I work within a team and the, the broader framework. So, for example, for me, a moderator uh, does have the responsibility for the process of the discussion or the reflection or the interview. That's why it's a moderator in the typical sense. But a moderator does not necessarily have the responsibility for uh, the entire program or the concept of the day. So, for example, a facilitator, in my understanding, has more responsibility for the overarching process of this entire workshop day. And it's possible that a facilitator can have a co-moderator who will be helpful in certain subsessions, but then there is a certain idea behind that and the facilitator says, okay, the idea of this session and this is the result I want to have and these are the, the things I, I need to extract and we're going to have five groups and I have five co-moderators and they will all help with that. And I feel as a facilitator, um, there is still the important difference that that the group is responsible for the result in the end. Mm -hmm. So the group is giving the final result. And as a trainer, I feel it's more my responsibility to also give input, to also find uh, good models, to also add new things. And um, I'm not saying that as, as a facilitator, I can't give input, but I feel it's not majorly my responsibility. Maybe I get like a... Um, a speaker or someone else, or I find a nice video, but I don't have to be subject matter uh, expert. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't need to be the, the subject matter expert, but if I'm in a trainer position, you I should be. be the expert. <laughs> <laughs> yes. and it, thank you for clarifying that. I think from what I hear and I agree is um, a moderator is almost detached of the outcome. So it's not about the outcome at all. It's about the conversation. And how to make sure that everyone adds to the conversation and that we have a flow in it and that we touch as many different points. 
a facilitator is interested in the outcome, but doesn't have responsibility for it. And a trainer is interested in the outcome and has responsibility for it. Yes. I do think that's a, that's a good distinguishment because uh, I feel it also adds to the growth. And I think it also, I don't think there is any one of those rules, uh, roles <laughs> that is easier. Because mm -hmm. I feel each of those parts has different tipping points. And I do feel an expert in each of those different areas can do a way better job than someone who's just like, oh, I'm, I'm just going to wing that on the side. Yeah. And I think that makes it really tough in some situations to really know what kind of head am I wearing? And is this part of a training session, an open discussion where I go into the role of a moderator And I don't give any input, but now I have to switch my head into the facilitator role and now I have to switch my head. So I feel that's the actual challenge if you fill multiple roles to know when to stop and mm. when to start. Yeah, yeah. Walking the line. Yes. And I would be very curious to hear the link between your background. So you just mentioned before we press the record button that you have a background in organizational psychology. Yes. And it was Jakob Kromi who told me, you have to talk to Yannick and bring him on the show <laughs> because of his use of board games or board game design, board game methodology, board game mindset. You're going <laughs> to tell me in the facilitation practice. Um, and organizational development. So yeah. I am intrigued. Well, I really love the idea of board games. And well, I started out with organizational psychology. That's my background. I studied that and I looked at different models in psychology. And then I looked into the different organizations. And because as a hobby, I really like board games. And I'm a big fan of really complex board games. The more complex they get, if there's a rule book, a literal book, people kind of get scared of that. And I'm like diving into that. And I'm usually the one explaining uh, the rules to an audience. Yeah, the nerd. <laughs> yes, I'm the nerd in the group, kind of. But that kind of teaches you a skill. How do I transfer those complex rules to a group and not make it boring? And uh, if I can transport one entire book of rules to a group and they want to start with a game within half an hour, then I feel I can also transport kind of those uh, models in psychology to a group of leaders and they kind of want to get going and they want to try it out. So explaining something like a rule set kind of also is good practice to explain like uh, psychological models because I feel psychological models, I really love them. There are some really great ones out there, but they tend not to look really sexy. Can you give like, an example? Well, for example, one of my favorite theories is like DC and Ryan with the self-determination theory, but I feel this is like a really great foundation when it comes to motivation. But what happens is that people take this kind of base and groundwork and then they added different wordings. They they all start with the same letter. All the letters start to spell a word. And then that's kind of fancy. And you can put that model out there and they call it a new model. But it's kind of just like reworked psychological base work. And then I feel it's kind of sad that those original work sometimes does not get the attention that it deserves. Because... It's complicated and it's more nuanced than than it it's easily graspable bubble <laughs> for other people. So I feel it's good to transfer those kind of topics and to explain them like a rule set in a in more intriguing way. So people do not get scared away by that. So self determination theory. Yes, for example. I Sounds really scary. like scary. What does it mean then in simple words? Well in And this is kind of a good link because I feel it's like one of the most important uh, ideas behind board games because in self-determination theory, it's a lot about internal motivation and external motivation. So when it to board games, it doesn't make a lot of sense to play them. 
if you look at it at a, from a rational point. Because when I go to an organization and I tell them, imagine people coming together on a Friday afternoon, sitting together and throwing their brain power on a problem for like two hours or more. And in the end, they just put that problem away and store it in a shelf. And then the next week, they come together again voluntarily and take out this exact same problem and throw their brain power on that problem again. And they're actually going to have fun doing that. And then they are not getting any money, but they spend money to buy the next version of that problem and make it more complicated to throw their brain power on organizations would be like that's crazy why would people do that you need to pay them money they need to people if if i give them a harder problem they ask do i get more money and i feel that's like the difference between external and internal motivation if you design work so uh, the work feels more intriguing for the internal motivation, then I don't need to come and try to give people more money and people won't be like, I, I play your shitty game only if you pay me that amount of money. And otherwise I won't play it. And this kind of applies to all areas where we have a hobby and it doesn't need to be board games. Some people don't like board games. I've heard about those kind of people. Apparently they exist. But any kind of hobby you're following is kind of exactly going in that direction where you uh, voluntarily invest time and most likely money to do work and throw your brain power or your skill in some area. And um, I do think it's very important to look, how does that work? Why do people do that? And why can't we design the workspace and the work environment with some more of those kind of factors that make it easier and more intriguing for people to work there? Yeah. What comes directly to my mind is Wikipedia. Mm -hmm. So, um, and I know that in sociology, and I guess also in psychology, there's lots of research Asking why would people do that? Because they don't even get the personal recognition. Mm -hmm. They don't even get the label and the stamp and the badge. And still they spend the brain power, their time on a public good. And yeah, how could organizations use that? So what's yeah. your theory? How? Well, I think you mentioned Wikipedia and I feel Wikipedia is kind of a, a special case because I feel... Maybe for the average user, people do not get any recognition. But I feel within certain subgroups, there is definitely competition and there's also recognition. And I feel that kind of shows that wherever there are smaller pockets, people still tend to to have this urge to improve things and to apply their knowledge. And I feel people nowadays even more want to share what they know. And it's not important to put a price tag on knowledge. It's more important to to add to a better understanding. And if people feel passionate about something, they want other people to know about that topic. And I feel what Wikipedia does, it gets together the people that are the most passionate about a topic and then just lets them share that topic. Mm. And so if I transfer that for organizations, I feel sometimes organizations try to start their own Wikipedia and uh, their own knowledge base. And it usually goes like that. There's a small group of people that feel very passionate and they start to write lots and lots of text And then they get tired and then other people use that base from time to time, but then it gets outdated. And the important question is, who's going to keep it up to date? And uh, the people that are knowing the best and the people that know the most actual information, they would need to have access to that and they would have to have the idea and the importance of keeping that information up to date. But then it often is like there are some gateways. Not everyone can just add it in an organization. 
So you have to apply changes to a certain group who approves those changes or does not approve. And there's already the gate where I feel it's already doomed because no one is going to go through that many hoops in order to keep mm -hmm. something updated. So I feel if you would start an internal Wikipedia, you would actually have to let go. Everyone can edit everything. And you would have to Wikipedia. trust your people. Yeah, mm -hmm. you would have to trust people yeah. to internally moderate that and not to have a specific group who keeps in check and charge. Mm -hmm. And I feel that's kind of where trust is an important role and where I feel, I mean, there is this kind of experiment where people change information on Wikipedia to random information and then how many seconds does it take or how many days until it gets uh, reworked and, and people find that mistake. And I feel organizations that trust their employees would also find out that if someone's making a mistake or writing some goofy stuff in there, other people would correct it. But only if they really use that framework and if they feel that's my daily tool I, I come back to and reuse every time why would I want my tools to be dirty why would I want my tools to be insufficient so people would start to clean up and people would start to rework their own tools Yeah, and I think it's trust on different levels it's trust in the individual that they have the knowledge and that they would share the knowledge to the best of their knowledge or intention with best intentions and trust in the intelligence of the organization as a whole, that if information is not accurate, that someone will jump in and correct it just like Wikipedia functions, right? Yeah. And therefore you need to be as lean and as transparent and possible to change all of that organically, naturally, as you said. Yeah. And I wonder bring it back because this is already the kind of the line where, how do we act how do we interact with tools in and each other in our private life and in organizations and to come back to your example of the board games and maybe also wikipedia how is it that sometimes we excel in certain roles and we can trust and we can play in board games Or maybe it's a personality type that um, we're the same people in both scenarios, whether we play a board game or in an organization, because we have those who always want to follow everything by the rule. Whenever there's a question, there are those who say, oh, let's consult the book and mm -hmm. see what the rules are. And others, guilty, <sighs> let's see what works best and we're going to make it up on the way, right? Yeah, yeah. And this is a source for conflict, potentially. It is. Yeah. And then there are those who are very competitive and like, I want to win. And others like, no, we're here to, to play. Don't take it so seriously. Another source for conflict. <laughs> yes. So I feel sometimes people say, I don't like board games. And I'm always saying, well, you didn't play the right board game with the right group. But I'm certain I can find the perfect board game for everyone. And it's more, you know, when, when people say, I don't like to play board games. And I ask them, well, why don't you? They're like, well, my parents made me play Monopoly. And I had to play Risk against my older siblings, and I always got my butt kicked. And now I don't want to play Trauma, anymore. childhood trauma. Yes, yes. <laughs> and I feel, well, you didn't play a good board game then. You didn't play, you didn't play your type of board game with your type of crowd. And uh, the same is true, I feel, as you mentioned, within organizations. If you are in, a, in an organization that is playing hardball and that's playing cutthroat, we don't make prisoners, doesn't matter, money first. And you are one of those kind of dreamy, hey, let's, let's do something good for the world. Well, it's not your working environment. You're going to be really upset there. It's the wrong board game and the wrong crowd. It's the wrong board game with the wrong crowd. But if you, for example, for me, board games, it's more like a small simulation. It's a certain set of rules that simulate certain certain interactions and that allow for certain interactions and that don't allow for certain interactions. And that's the way they create an experience. I really like the explanation I heard uh, somewhere else. It's not my idea, but I really like it. It's like you get a script for a theater play, but just because you have the script, it doesn't mean it's always the same show. 
And if you have a certain cast, you can play Shakespeare in a really funny, fancy way. But if you have a different cast, it gets really serious. And the same is true with board games. I can have the same set of rules and I can play the same board game with one group. And it's going to be a jolly round. It's going to be lots of laughter. People are going to stand up, drink and chat. And in a different group, the exact same game is going to be silent, thinking and cutthroat manner. And then... They're totally different outcomes. And I feel this is one thing why I feel that's also important for facilitation in workshops. It's it's what kind of expectations do I have? And if you are sitting in a workshop environment and you start to lay out the rules or whatever, and you have some people in there that want to want to have a jolly workshop and have like fun time and experience new ideas. And you have a couple of people and they're like, okay, and now we're going into cutthroat mode. It doesn't work. So I feel it's really important to, to start with the expectation, for example, in certain workshops. A simple deck of cards can be a brilliant way to engage a group. You can use them to stimulate thought, inject energy or spark lively conversations. But how can you use cards when you're facilitating virtually? Deckhive.com is a brand new platform that enables you to use cards on screen just as you would face to face. Invite people to a shared real time session and then let them select, move and flip cards over. Our growing library includes many popular card decks, including picture cards, strengths cards, emotion cards and more. But if we don't have what you need, you can even create your own deck really easily. Use the code WORKSHOPSWORK when you subscribe to a paid monthly plan and you'll get the first month completely free. Go to deckhive.com and give it a try. What came to my mind was immediately the question that I usually ask related to workshops and I want to ask it related to board games. What makes a board game night fail? What makes a board game night fail probably is the same thing that makes workshops fail. (laughs) So... One thing I feel that makes it fail is if you have a great divergence of expectations. If some people are coming to that night and they feel, I finally can wrestle someone with my mind power and we're going to have a really hard standoff and we're going to fight hard and that's fine. And then afterwards we can shake hands and it's going to be a good evening. I had those kind of rounds and it's great fun, but you have to have this certain mindset with it and you have to expect people to like take 10 minutes to think about their next move. And you have to think that people will on the finish line use the most backstabbing cutthroat move just to get in front. And afterwards you congratulate and it's fine. It was a fair fight and they used everything within the rules they could to make win. And there are other rounds when I feel It's so much more important to look at, does everybody feel involved? Is everybody having fun? Is that a nice evening for everyone? And I think that's one of the most important parts to know what kind of evening, what kind of experience do I want to create if I'm the host of a workshop slash board game. And the other thing I feel that are what what makes workshops fail is more on this level, how will people remember that workshop? Mm. Because I feel often workshops that feel very jolly and everybody had fun sometimes lack impact. And it's like, yeah, it was nice, but we're not following up on that. There is, it doesn't change anything. So I feel it's a question, how will people remember that game night how will people remember that workshop and did it actually have an impact on their daily work not the board game but obviously the workshop you know is there something they they experience after that that they now i'm coming back to dc and ryan that they feel i also had an impact Uh, there Mm -hmm. is uh, something i influenced yeah which makes me again curious because I think the impact somehow often happens through conflict. So working through the parts that are not easy, because then it solves an issue or it solves a knot. And so I was thinking about the board games that boards play. So what makes a board game fail is 
the different expectations as you described for a board game night it's easy ish you think of the crowd you invite and you make sure that we all have the same expectations okay is this all about kumbaya and a jolly time or is it about showing who's the best player in the game in the room whereas a board meeting you do have the different players they are set You might have rules of the board game, but you still have different expectations or different personalities and how they join the game. Yes. yes. So I feel there are certain, and now now it's more like this is not these are not the only things that make board games fail. You know, there's way more that can make a board game a bad or a good board game, and I feel one of those factors is how tightly narrowed people will enjoy that like how how small is the slice of crowd that will enjoy that and there are some board games that are really specific and if you find the right match and you find the right people it's fantastic but they need to be really specific and in that area and there are other board games that are more broad and people find their spot within the game and you can play it a little more competitive you can play it a little more jolly it's more flexible and i feel if 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 the crowd is set i have to decide for a game if I'm providing the game or I have to decide for a workshop environment while I feel everybody has a place where they can play into their competences, where they can place their knowledge, where they can place their expectations, where they can provide something for the outcome. And I need to give a room where people can express their feeling and the jolly side and I have some fun elements in there. And I also need to have a certain space where people that feel more like we need to get things done and move along can place bullet points and they have the feeling of accomplishment. And so I feel the flexibility is mm -hmm. important in that matter as well. And I feel, for example, that board games often have three different layers that I look in board games, but I also feel when I look at, at gamification or gamified elements in workshops, I, I look at three different elements. So You could say layers or levels, depending how gamey you want to phrase it. But I feel the first one is the topping. It's like the, the, the surface. It's kind of the idea, what kind of interface do I use? It's the visual and the, the tactical feeling of your material in a workshop. So, for example... I could give you a questionnaire with like 20 questions and you have to answer them and it kind of feels boring and it kind of feels like I'm getting tested. So people do not really like that. Imagine a workshop or a training and I have like, okay, now we had this model and here are 20 questions, answer them and I will correct them and I will see if you actually understood what I want. <laughs> people will be like, oh my God, back to school, terrible. But if I go like, okay, let's have a quiz show about this and we have like two groups and people can answer different questions, different degree of, you know, uh, trickiness and uh, they get points for that and then they can challenge each other. People get like, oh, that's, that's a fun game. Let's play that. But in the end, I'm still asking questions and I want answers for them. So all I changed was the surface. All I changed was how do people interact with that? And if I have an intriguing surface, if I have an intriguing kind of a way to interact with the topic, people tend to keep their attention longer. But in the end, I cannot forget, I didn't change anything about the content. So sometimes I feel organizations think, oh, we reworked our environment and now people get points if they do if they sell something they get points and if they have enough points then a bell rings and it's shiny or you know when it comes to like soccer it's like the world series of soccer and we have teams and they go against each other and then we we play that and it's it's gamification i feel like no it's not well you know yeah you change the surface but you're still using the same mechanisms behind that you're still using the same competition mechanisms with the same advantages and disadvantages. That's a very interesting point. And it reminds me of a conversation I had with Lily Higgins, I think, on gamification. And to what extent or where does it start to become manipulative? 
because I'm thinking of the beginning of our, our conversation. I'm like, okay, how come that in certain situations in our private life we would sit down and solve a problem, even pay money for it, and it's fun. And in the organizational context, we want money for solving problems. Yeah. So our organizations could use these gamifications, these toppings, shiny objects to one might call it manipulate mm -hmm. their um, employees so that they ask for less money to solve the problem. Yes. Yeah, I feel that's that's true because right now we're still like on the first level and I feel that's like the surface because I kind of feel, okay, you're just scratching the first surface. But people, as I said, they tend to to take longer, but they will see through that. Mm -hmm. If you have a bad game, it doesn't matter that it's really shiny and that it's really nice. People will play it just one, two, three times and then they leave it. And then it doesn't matter how shiny or expensive or fancy the game looks. If it doesn't hold up, people mm -hmm. will look through that. And I feel the same is true here. And that's why this kind of, I think, kind of bad gamification always needs to be reworked is people start to be like, oh, now we see some results. You know, people are interacting more with that, but now they, they stop interacting. We need to rework it into a more shiny surface because last time it worked. So we need to add more belts. We need to add more points and badges and stuff. And then it keeps working again and people get get really easy looking through those kind of systems because we're actually training them because this is like the fifth iteration. We present them with some kinds of point system, which I feel is really bad implementation of the idea of gamification. I feel good gamification does not use and doesn't need any points. Mm. And yeah, so I feel this is like, People look through that and sometimes they need sense. longer. Sometimes they, they, they're quicker with that, but it doesn't hold up very long. Thank you. This makes I, total sense, uh, which also brings us back to the Wikipedia example and the trust in the people and intelligence yes. of an organization. Great. I, so you I, said there are three layers. Yeah. So number one, yeah. I interrupted you. No, Sorry. don't. Uh, that, that's totally fine. That's totally fine. Yeah, the, you're right. The, the second layer I feel that is important to look at is the area of mechanics. So what kind of mechanics and rules do I build into, for example, when I design a workshop unit or when I design something like a serious game or something? And um, this is the part I feel that is often used, for example, if you play like the ballpoint game or if you play like Scrum with Lego or something like that. You try to simulate the rules that are in the real world and you try to reduce them so you can kind of play it in a more fast forward way. And so you give certain rule sets and people get this kind of mini game and then they can try an error and they can test different strategies. But in the end, there is one perfect strategy. So there is one way to approach that game. So for example, if you play the pizza game or something that tries to show you how does a bottleneck work, you know, you realize, ah, I need to change my work in progress level and then I will be better at this game. I will get more points. What is the pizza game? Oh, um, this is one of those workshop uh, games and it's basically people are in different groups and uh, each group has to make a certain part of a pizza. So one group is making the dough and they just like cut out a circle and the next group has to make some um, toppings and the next one has some cheese and then there's one step where they have to put it in the oven and in the end the question is how many pizzas did we get? And depending how you set up the rules, there are some steps that take longer and some steps that are more quicker. But in the end, it doesn't matter if I have like five more pizza doughs ready to go if I don't have any topping I can put on them. And then you realize it doesn't matter if, if, if I improve pizza dough making and I have like 20, well, there's still 20 unused pizza doughs. I need to improve a different point in the chain. And I'm sure other people will explain that game way better. And it's just why, why I want to point out if you, if you want to 
reduce certain mechanics, there is often still the idea there is a right or a wrong approach to that. You can fail at this game. You can have less or more points. You can win kind of this game. And I do feel there's an advantage here because it's way easier to explain something in a game and let people experience that within an hour, what otherwise in the real world would take like half a year. And then I can't, often can't afford to let people fail half a year in the real world and be like, oh, now you learned your lesson. Isn't that great? <laughs> um, so that's, that's kind of a great advantage. The disadvantage, however... If I only focus on the mechanisms, is you always have some smart people within the group that find the, the loopholes. And sometimes if you do not set up the rules really, really well, then people find loopholes where they can cheat. And then people learn, oh, if I bend the rules in the right way and I find a, a different approach, then I can win on this simulation. But the same way, of cheating often does not apply in the real world. You can't copy the same behavior and then it kind of falls apart. So it's always a kind of a balance you have to, to, to get. If I focus on mechanics, I kind of want to let you experience something. I want to let you experience how it feels to fit within certain rules and how you can use them to your advantage and how does it feel if you try out different roles, which brings me back to what you said, that sometimes people try to be, how does it feel to be in the role of looking into the rules every time and sometimes how does it feel to be like, okay, it's just a game, let's just try it. And then they feel, oh, that actually worked really well. Maybe in real life I should let go more often as well. So the mechanic side of games needs to be designed really well. And that's why I feel it's really important to think about it quite a lot. And that's why I feel some serious games have a great advantage on the market and the, why they are on the market for such a long time because they found a way to have a really intriguing set of rules that interact really well and you cannot cheat easily and you need the group and the certain mindset and prepare them for that so they actually learn something. And that kind of brings me to the third layer that I feel is the most intriguing one, but it's also kind of the hardest. And this is also the layer why I feel it's important to be with a group as they go through that process. And this is the layer of like self-reflection. Mm. And this is the layer where I feel it doesn't matter if you win or lose. It doesn't matter. There is no right or wrong. It's just the idea that I give you a certain room you can experience and the question is, how did you use that room? So, for example, if there's a possibility in a game, you can build your own town, but you can also win by destroying the town other people are building. Mm -hmm. you know? Some people have the tendency to be like, well, if I, I can win either way, maybe sometimes it's more important or I would have the greater advantage by destroying someone else's building. Sometimes... You know, I have the advantage by taking the card that would give you most points. I'm not getting any points, but you're not getting them either. So maybe I win by that. But other times people tend to be like, oh, I take the card that's giving me most advantage, even though I give you a card that gives you even more advantage. So it's more the idea to reflect on that. What makes you choose that behavior? How does it feel? And how would you use that space within the game framework? And what would happen if you show the same behavior in a work environment? And this is kind of why I like to, to use games in workshop setups, especially with leaders, because usually when I show a psychological model and I'd be like, look at that model, it's really like, you know, smart people worked a lot on this many years of research. People have this tendency to be like, yeah, we, we kind of know that. It's kind of this already known before effect psychology wise, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. Yeah. I kind of had the feeling that that sounds plausible. We already do that. But I feel if I let them experience it first within a game 
And then I'm like, what happened here? And then I show the model and be like, hey, this is kind of a model you experienced just like a minute ago. Then they have a, a much better understanding, much deeper understanding and connection. And I started out by going with the theory first and then mm -hmm. going with like experience that theory now. And now I changed it. I go with experience first and then reflect on that. And then I'll, in the end, there's the reveal of, hey, maybe this model fits your experience as well. Thank you for staying tuned and listening to the show. I appreciate your attention as I know how busy you are. If you enjoyed it, please subscribe and engage by sharing your comments and thoughts and visit workshops.work to download the one-page summary. I'm looking forward to seeing you back at the next episode and I wish you a fruitful day.